what is fermentation. Uh, just to uh, keep it a little bit simple, uh, there's a, a bacteria and yeast, you probably heard, of, heard about them, that they use for coffee production. Um, but quite simply put, it's, it's a, this is a, under a microscope of how fermentation can work. Uh, but basically, the microorganisms, the, the yeast, the bacteria, they, they transform the sugars into the, all the different uh, compounds, and as a byproduct, you get the flavonoids uh, production in coffee. Um, uh, it's basically like a, it's a, a meta metabolic process, is what they call it, same as you would metabolize your own food. Uh, that's what, how the microorganisms, the yeast, the bacteria, get their energy. So they, they take the sugars and they take they, what they want is to survive. They want to they want to to remain intact to to um, to upkeep their cell uh, membranes and all this stuff. And to do this, they eat the sugars, uh, and we call that process fermentation, where they break those like a uh, heavier biomolecular compounds into smaller, simpler ones. Um, yeah, and as a byproduct, we. Uh, happily get uh, get all the, the extra um, flavors. So the quality requirements are pretty much the usual as, as for normal coffee as well. So that's the cherry quality, the time and the environment, very simply put. But we'll go a little bit more in detail later on. So cherry quality, I mean, everyone knows that the better cherry quality, the cherries you, you pick, uh, the more riper, like uh, not, it doesn't have to be unripe or not overripe. At the perfect time, it needs to be picked to get the most out of the cherry. I think I don't have to go too deep into like uh, natural washed and all the, the standard uh, practices. I think I'm sort of kind of hoping you guys all have that base. And if you if you don't, just just let me know. Any question is okay to to, to ask. Uh, time because you uh, if you if you ferment something for ten minutes, I don't think you're gonna see a lot of the benefits. Uh, any environment, you want the right bacteria to, to proliferate and the, and the wrong ones to die out. Um, so, uh, the first part is like a little bit more known ones, so dry or wet fermentation, uh, aerobics so with oxygen, anaerobics without oxygen, semi anaerobic and extended fermentation. Because um, I to just thought I would add the wash, natural, and honey. Uh, just so you know the difference. So you, sometimes we call it dry fermented coffee. So this would be dry fermented coffee, where you pulp the coffee. Um, so you remove the mucilage and the skin through the pulper. So the coffee is picked from the farmer, gets brought to the washing station. I, I, I'm assuming you all know how that process works. And then at the washing station, this will be a washing station, they will have fermentation tanks, dry fermentation and wet fermentation. So with dry fermentation, the coffees, when they're pulped, uh, depulped, so the, the skin and the, and the mucilage or the, the fruit is, uh, is taken off, they'll put it here. So you can have a dry fermentation, for example, if, a, if, a, if the coffee is just depulped, so you remove the skin and, you, and, and the fruit, but you leave the mucilage on, it could become a honey. Well, if you wash everything, you put it in a wet fermentation and you just wait until all the mucilage is gone, then it will be a washed coffee. So, uh, but all of this will be aerobic because there will be oxygen even under the water. It will turn a little bit uh, semi-anaerobic maybe, but we would call it aerobic coffee because there's a lot of oxygen in the water as well. Um, and then the, the reason why is of course, I mean, we, for washed coffee, you will get a cleaner coffee. If natural, we will get more of the fruit, funky flavors that you might want. Uh, natural is also called dry process, so not to be confused with maybe wet uh, or dry fermented. So the fermentation happens in here, you put it in the tank. The dry process is, is what they call a natural, for example, because they put the natural cherries when they deliver to the washing station straight onto the drying bed, and that's so no water used. That's why they call it a dry uh, process. Uh, honey is a little bit in between. The reason why is simply, um, I think it's like before there was flavor, they probably understood that there were uh, there were just some uh, some things that they couldn't do on the washing station. Maybe they didn't have the water, they didn't have the pumps in the beginning when they just started processing all these coffees. 
So it was just easier to do natural coffee. That's the first that they started. You have a cherry, you put it in a, on, a, on, a, on a patio or a field or a dirt road or whatever. You just dry it in the sun, most natural process, uh, very cheap. And then they added a uh, wash process and later on honey made. Uh, honey kind of comes from the Central American uh, countries where it was also, where there's a lot more innovation uh, with it over the last few years. Um, honey, because it just uses less water, natural, same thing. And then afterwards, now, of course, we know that it has a lot of impact on flavor. So now we might pick and choose and pay for the process that we want based on flavor instead of just uh, maybe minimizing water use, although that's, that's super good use, especially in these times. Um, so the next one, you have anaerobic and semi-anaerobic. That's what we would call a coffee. Carbonic maceration sometimes used, we don't really use it, but carbon maceration basically means you're pumping in uh, CO2 into a barrel, for example. What that does is it pushes out all the other gases, the oxygen, um, and creates an anaerobic environment, so without oxygen, because the oxygen is pushed out. Um, what we would call an anaerobic is this, this kind of coffee. So we put it in a barrel, and then you have a water lock, just like you would with beer brewing, so the the, the oxygen is pu uh, pushed out. The, there's a lot of buildup because uh, as a side pro uh, product of the fermentation that I just explained. So where the bacteria and the yeast are, are eating the sugars as a byproduct, they will also create CO2. Yeah? So the CO2 slowly, it, like on a moment, the fruit is put in a barrel or the fruit is put on a drying table or whatever the fermentation happens. The, the, the yeast and the bacteria that are already present on any kind of fruit or that are here right now, they're everywhere. They're, uh, and, but there's lactic acid bacteria on the fruit, the yeast uh, are already present on the fruit. So the moment you put the uh, fruit here, it starts to decompose and start to uh, ferment. So it starts to, the bacteria start to eat the sugars and the byproduct will, uh, will create gas. So of course, if you put it here, you won't notice. But if you put it in a barrel, and you have a lot of fruit concentrated, so a lot of sugar, all of the the, the, acid, the, the bacteria and the yeast that are already present will start to create this, this uh, CO2. And what will happen, it will fill the barrel slowly with CO2 and then push out the oxygen. Um, and at a certain point, you'll, you'll create a very oxygen poor or completely oxygen-less um, environment. With carbonic maceration, they want to speed up this process, so they pump in the CO2 um, yeah, just to create the process quicker. What we've seen is that it, even with a semi-anaerobic process, it, like the, the impact on flavor, it, it's, not, it's not that much difference. So whether you make a semi-anaerobic or anaerobic, uh, you can extend the time maybe a little bit, but besides that, it, it doesn't impact the flavor too much. It's sometimes yeah, there's still a lot to learn about it because sometimes the semi-anaerobic might even taste funkier, what we would call funkier, than anaerobic. So it's it's a little bit um, difficult to understand. Semi-anaerobic is what we would call a coffee if the producer will try to make an anaerobic coffee, but it doesn't have the infrastructure. So maybe, uh, or we just want to make it as easy as possible because that's one of the key things that we want for the producer to do. If we ask them to make a certain kind of uh, fermentation, we need it to be as simple as possible with the producer. Like, there's no use if we're gonna ask, like, okay, we need a, uh, specific meters, a moisture reader every day, temperature re uh, readers every day, humidity levels, uh, color, or whatever. And then uh, the farmer doesn't have the, 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 the money for it, or doesn't have the staff for it to check up on it. So it needs to be as simple as possible. And that's why this is very useful. I will also show you a little bit, uh, a few other ways of doing it, but semi-anaerobic, we'll generally call things like this. So where we want the, 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 the flavors, the flavor impact of an anaerobic, uh, the same kind of funky development, uh, maybe a little like vinegary, if you keep it very long uh, in a controlled environment, it can actually taste pretty good. Um, what we'll call semi-anaerobic, if they don't have all the valves and if they don't have all the practices required to, to make it a fully oxygenless uh, environment. Then it will be semi-anaerobic. Um, anaerobic will be more like this, or like with the, with the valve, where they put, really push out the, the gas. Uh, and this is, these are good examples 
what we do with producers. So, as I said, like one of the key components is that it's simple. They need to just be able to do this inside of a normal handling, a normal process of a coffee. Otherwise, it's no use because a lot of things cannot be followed. Or it's like if you if you're stressed and you you're in the middle of the production and all of the cherries are coming in, you want the process to have the least impact on the on the already existing um, infrastructure that you're doing. So that's why we uh, why we gave them this, these recipes. Uh, this is a um, uh, pile of coffees. This is, you you tasted this this morning for those who cupped it. Um, so we'll make basically make like a sausage for a taco, and it's just uh, it's super simple. It's just a, sort of like a thick plastic layer. You put a bunch of uh, cherries um, on this plastic, and then you just roll it up really, really tightly, so that the air go. Um, so there's not a lot of air inside. And the air will also be slowly pushed inside. It will create very funky coffees, probably also because there's so much coffee inside. And and depending on the um, on the producer, the environment, the, the origin, uh, most of the times these are just directly in the sunlight, so they will create a lot of heat inside. Um, so uh, also depending on the on the environment and the, the, the climate, they will sometimes open them up and then they will hustle it a little bit and then it will close it again. Um, so the cherries, as a result, a result of this uh, and uh, all, all of these fermentations, they look kind of weird. Like when you're used to uh, to, wa to wash coffees or normal natural coffee, this looks a little uh, interesting, <laughs> I would say. Um, then we have the lesser known ones, we would call like extended fermentation or the pile up, I already showed you. That's the ones that we talked about this morning as well. And we have skin contact, sacharic, uh, lactic, and spicy, spicy wash, that's something new. And then this, uh, uh, yeah, so we have the um, extended fermentation here, uh, where you have a tank. Uh, we usually uh, give that name to wash coffee, so they've been pulped, and then we extend the fermentation, the time of the fermentation in this tank here. Um, and then you have the pile up here. I already explained that part. Extended fermentation can also give really funky flavors, but it's not. Um, close off from oxygen, so there will be oxygen, so that's why, we, why you don't call it uh, um, anaerobic, and it's also a little bit more closer to the to what they are already doing in origin, or what they're used to. Uh, skin contact is also kind of taken from the wine industry, so you have your, co your coffee, you, like your cherry, you depulp it in a depulper, where they remove the skin and the, and the mucic, and then they will add the skins back to the barrels. Yeah, these setups look very simple, but they can create uh, beautiful flavors, complex flavors. Like again, you want it to be as simple as possible. If you if you just make if you just make sure that the producer cleans all of their stuff um, well, then it shouldn't be any problem. This looks like shit, <laughs> but it is. It, it, this can be from just one batch. I mean, if you if you have clean water, yeah, which it was. And you put in a uh, coffee and uh, cherries and whatever, it will look like apple juice, like this. So um, that doesn't say anything about the, the, the quality of like cleanliness. Besides that, it looks pretty clean, the setup. And it's all pretty simple, you know, like you need to keep things simple. Um, so this is one of the processes we do with, um, with Prince Estate. So the, the, we use a yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, this is what it looks under the microscope. And you don't really see too much difference, but uh, if, with a closer up, you would see that the coffee has yeast growing on it. This yeast, uh, different than, than lactic acid bacteria, this, this likes um, more dry environments. So this yeast, you want to add to the drying tables. So it's already been through all the depulping or not, maybe you put a natural coffee or whatever, and then you go through that whole process, you put it on a drying table, and then you add this yeast on the drying table, and it will start to grow. Uh, and depending on the recipe, maybe you leave it one day, or two days, or three days, it's usually not, not much longer, but uh, we have to experiment with it. We, like our experience is also maybe two years now that we've been using it. Um, yeah. And then we have uh, 
galactic coffee. I put it together with the spice awards, not because of the, uh, the same bacteria, but because they sort of uh, added at the same stage of the fermentation. So you will have lactobacillus bacteria, but they, these bacteria are always present on any fruit. Yeah? So any kind of uh, fermentation, you would, would be able to call lactic fermentation. But the reason why we don't is because they're uh, the colony is not that big, the colony of the bacteria. So what we do at a lact, why we call, uh, uh, when we call a, a coffee lactic is because we, um, we, we added lactic bacteria to the fermentation phase or fins up it or any, like, any producer that, that, that we call lactic. For now it's only, only Prinza, I think still. Um, and then basically they will have, they will, they will order these lactic uh, bacteria from a, uh, from a lab where it's grown. It's all, I'm also happy to say that this, I had one question about, from a customer that said, that asked, uh, is, it, uh, is it vegetarian or uh, vegan or something? And it is, it's just lab grown. It, there's no milk or whatever used. Um, so uh, yeah, so the, the, the point being here is that you will go through the whole uh, normal processing uh, method. So like it can be either wash, natural, honey, any kind of coffee you want. You have to see that as two different components. So you have a, you have the washed, honey, natural, one thing. That's your normal process. You will always have this, yeah. And then you, besides that, you can make the washed, maybe an anaerobic, or maybe you can make the washed lactic coffee. And then uh, you will add one or two steps in between the normal uh, way of processing. So the lactic, they will add to the fermentation tank or to these barrels or whatever vessel that you use to ferment the coffee. So it can be one of those fermentation tanks that we saw earlier with the tiles. You can add the lactic there if you want. Then it won't be an anaerobic because there will be air added. Um, maybe you can make an extended fermentation uh, lactic coffee or an anaerobic. The extended fermentation will be in the fermentation tank that we saw. So you extend the, the period of time. And an anaerobic would be in, in these barrels, for example, with a water lock so that the, uh, the gas is, uh, pushes out the oxygen. Um, yeah, and then they add, just add a bunch, way too much lactic acid bacteria. The reason why you want to do this, the simple reason is because, I mean, there are already lactic bacteria, so why would you do it? Uh, the reason why is because you want the environment to be as favorable for this lactic acid bacteria. So you know that in the beginning, if you, only, if you have a little bit of lactic uh, acid bacteria, uh, and you don't have the proper environment, maybe the pH is too low or too high or it's too warm or too, too, the temperature is too low maybe, um, it will take a while until this lactobacillus is gonna grow and create its own environment. The lactic acid bacteria, as its name uh, suggests, add, uh, adds lactic acids to the coffee. This acid will create a pH that's too low for a lot of uh, uh, other bacteria to grow or other yeast or other competing organisms. So what, the, what that bacteria wants to do, just like us, they want to proliferate in this, um, in this environment. So basically they're waging war and all the other stuff and trying to lower the pH of the, um, of the environment uh, low enough so that the other stuff will not grow and will not compete with them and that they can uh, uh, grow better and, ma and make their complete the environment that they want. Uh, and it just so happens that that's also the beneficial flavor that we get. On this lactic, uh, like the lactic mouthfeel, the lactic the spicy, uh, funky stuff that we want. So what do we do to help them a little bit? You add, you just add a bunch of lactic bacteria to it. And it's also used in uh, in a bunch of other uh, industries. Um, also, at the Saccharomyces, uh, it's nothing new. Yeah, we've been using this for, well, I don't know, since ever since it was. Uh, found that it, like they might not have known the name but even uh, just after roman times they were using this yeast because they were they were uh, creating like a big culture they didn't know it was that they, were, they just thought oh this is a reproducing uh, wine for example they've been using it in wine and in beer and in bread making yeah so in all of that stuff the fermentation is basically the same yeah so if you make bread 
what causes the bread to rise and to create little bubbles inside is the CO2, yeah? So the, the bacteria, they're eating the sugars, yeah? And pooping out CO2 and all the stuff and all the flavor that you want. And then in the bread, the bread rises, but because of the gluten, it traps all of the, the CO2 and creates the little bubbles. So if you break it open bread, you see the bubbles, that's because of the CO2 created by this fermentation. Um, and then the spicy wash or natural coffee can be both. Spicy, we call it spicy wash, spicy natural. In this case, what you tasted this morning, like I'm not a big fan of like adding maybe like spices or whatever to it, but to each his own. And uh, I mean, if so many people like it, then people like it, right? So, and as long as it's like a process besides that is done well, and there's like um, a good um, incentive for the farmer and uh, yeah, we can debate about this. <laughs> Some people do, uh, are like purists and uh, don't like it. Maybe Tim, I don't know what his, what his feelings are about it. But uh, anyway, the spicy wash that you tasted this morning was uh, with cardamom. In this case, the cardamom is like, a, it's pretty cool cardamom because it's like this, um, it's grown in the west of Ethiopia. And the cardamom is a little bit different than uh, you would maybe buy in the supermarkets. So they're not like these small green pots, but they're huge with a lot of seeds, and they grow on a vine, and then they, they dry that in the sun, and you can buy them on the market, like with these like big vines with like, uh, lots of pots on it. They will dry this, they, in this case, they will open the pots, and then you have these, I'm not sure if you've ever opened a pot of cardamom, but then you have the little black uh, spots, the uh, little seeds, and then you grind this, and then you get cardamom uh, powder. And they put like uh, a bunch of that stuff during in the fermentation thing, just like, here on this video where they put um, the like where they just put in the lactic acid bacteria into this fermentation tank. They do the same with uh, cardamom uh, there. Cool. And then you add, you you finish it as either a washed coffee or a natural coffee. So a wash to remove the skin, the pulp. Uh, you um, uh, you wash away the the mucilage, everything. Um, the wash is also interesting because there's always a fermentation going on. So now we call like a, for some specific fermentations, oh, there's a fermented ferment coffee, but wash is all, has always been heavily fermented. So you put the coffee bean, which has been removed, the, the, the skin has been removed, most of the fruits have been removed maybe from the depulper, the machine that pops the, the seed and leaves all the fruit and the, and the skin. And you put, put the, um, the what's left, the, the parchment and the, the, the bean, you put it in a, in a fermentation tank, maybe with water or dry, like I explained earlier. And then because of the fermentation, you start to nibble on all the sugars and on the little bit of mucilage that's left. Yeah? And then when all the mucilage is left, then you have a washed coffee. You wash it, you rinse it off, you wash it off, and you have a washed coffee. Or you, you finish it as a natural coffee. So with the whole cherry on the drying bed, uh, Pretty low intervention, and then you, uh, yeah. this is the double rainbow dip thermal space shark. So that they bring the coffee uh, straight to uh, to space around the moon, and they come back, and then unicorns start to uh, <laughs> dance on this coffee. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a coffee that's called uh, double shark uh, thermal shark or something. It's just um, they just they uh, they shock the coffee or something uh, like maybe a single shock is like uh, where they change the temperature or a double shock is where they change the temperature twice or yeah it's it's recently it's quite recent so I don't know the, the details about that we don't do that um, yeah I can um, imagine that you maybe you will confuse like where do you put the lactic where do you put the anaerobic but like I already mentioned, it's it's good to to understand that the base is a washed natural or honey coffee. Yeah, same as it always been, same as it always will be. So you have your washed coffee, you, you get the cherry, yeah, it gets brought to the washing station, and at that point you enter maybe some kind of fermentation or processing. So in a natural, it gets brought to the washing station, goes straight to the drying bed, and is dried in the sun and brought back to uh, the moisture level that you want. Um, if you want an anaerobic natural, yeah, it's brought to the washing station just like before, 
and then instead of doing it straight to the drying table, you put it in a barrel, one of those barrels that you saw, with the, blue, the blue barrel with the black lids, and you close it up, you put the whole cherries in the barrel, and you open it up, and then the, 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 the cherry will look a little weird, like I uh, showed earlier, and then you put it on the drying table, and you finish it as, as an actual, that's it. Uh, lactic, same thing, maybe a wash coffee, so in that case, the, 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 the coffee would be brought to the washing station, it goes through the pulper, mucilage, skin is removed, you put it in a, in a, uh, either in a, in a barrel, maybe with the skin, so it will be a skin contact, or with other skin, and there will be an aerobic for this coffee. Th this is where it's like, where you can choose a little bit. What, what, what we have seen is that if you completely wash the coffee, like you finish the wash process, and then you add it in anaerobic fermentation, I mean, there's not a lot, a lot of sugar left. Like there's not so much sugar on the, on the bean or in the bean that can be transformed. So then you will not get a, uh, you, you will not get a fermentation. The good thing about fruit is that it has sugar, and then, then you can create booze or whatever you want to create funky flavors. Um, so there's not a lot of impact afterwards. So usually what we see is that you, because you want to taste something, like if you're doing all of this stuff, you, know, you want to have some kind of impact on the flavor. So what you do, you, you have your whole cherry with the fruit, or maybe you just pop the coffee, and you put it in the fermentation tank, and you let the bacteria take over, or you add lactic acid bacteria, if that's what you want, to create a, a proper environment, and then you finish it as a wash coffee. Hope that's a little clear, a little bit of. Uh, how is quality maintained? Pretty much same as all the other coffees. Like there's people uh, on the um, on the ground. There's agronomists, producers. Some producers will have agronomists. Not everyone. It's a it's an expense. Um, they will keep hold of uh, a lot of the parameters, and maybe they will control the temperature. In this case. Someone is checking the temperature with this uh, laser gun. They will open the barrel and they will check how, what temperature it is inside. And they will maybe uh, um, keep track of that, track, keep track of that. Or if the temperature is too, too, too high, they will maybe move the barrel inside with some shade or where, like a, to a place where it's more windy. Or it, 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 also, it all depends on what the infrastructure is that is already present producer we want to make it as simple as possible even this is quite I mean it's it seems super simple but uh, un until you at, in, at your place your little home you have a little backyard and then you have to move 50 of these barrels around every day to see if they have the temperature and then it's gonna get a little complicated so um, a lot of times would it just be huge uh, amount of bags just in a hall stash on the shade or maybe the temperature is not too high, and then you want to maybe keep it directly in the sun. You create a little bit more funky coffee because temperature is going to rise, more of these bacteria will grow, uh, and you'll get more uh, funky coffee. So, but it needs to be simple. As beside that, there's a lot of the parameters are the same as all the other coffee. So, during the night, this. Like these are in bags, for example. You see bags, in, in, but the same can be done with a drying table. Usually, they they cover it at night to protect it from the moisture or from from the temperature, uh, or they they leave it open. It just depends on the on the environment and who's seeing it. And this is where also where we come in and you guys come in. So we cop a lot and we give them feedback. Of course. Like the problem with these fermentations and the experiments is that they're they're new. That's why they experiments. So we need to to make sure that we buy the coffee. So when we tell them, hey, can you make a, a three hundred day fermentation? <laughs> yeah, sure. But we have to buy it, and it tastes like shit probably three hundred days. But uh, we have to commit to buying some kind of coffee because they're they're putting in risk, uh, and they don't really know the result yet. And it can go either way, and it's also weather dependent, and it's like the cup producing processing in general is already very well dependent so this adds another risk so we need to make sure that we're there for the farmers and commit to buying these coffee otherwise it doesn't really make sense besides that all of the things to control quality are pretty much the same as normal 
So you check the temperature regularly, you check the environment regularly. Here, this is a, nor this is a, um, a washed coffee, it will be end up to, into uh, drying beds. This is a pretty fancy setup. On tables with like, um, what do you call it? Like a mesh, mesh. make you like a chicken mesh uh, thing. Uh, so that they have airflow, and then he's uh, checking the, the the water moisture and the water content. So, but that's something that's done normally for for our coffees. We want the moisture content to be a specific level, so it doesn't age too fast. And then we go a little bit beyond fermentation. Um, yeah, this is, here's the pile of coffee again. Uh, this also for us. It brought up a new perspective on sorting because it's very important because we've noticed that especially with the pilot for example that we started doing that for like one specific customer in Russia um, and we developed a sort of like a sausage thing with him and and then we noticed that if we if we sort it the same way as we normally do and we take out all the the, the, the coffee that looks like shit like the, maybe little black spots or that kind of like of course the really shitty things you have to keep out because then you'll get just the phenolics and a bunch of shitty things but in general if the coffee looks super homogenous very good it has less body it has less complexity we've seen it's less sweet so it's it's a it's a it's a choice that you have to make sometimes these funky coffee you have to look at okay what do you want to get out of this process like do you want a clean coffee or you want like a funky coffee because that's what, what you then intend to do maybe. Um, so it's some coffees we, we decide to completely clean it up and you see like um, it's um, maybe missing body, missing sugar, sweetness, but it's maybe a little bit more floral. So you still have a little bit more maybe the characteristics of the origin. So it, it's a question that is, is like loose and we're still experimenting with it. There's some coffee stays better, some coffee tastes a little hollow if we if we sort it too much. So that's why some of the coffees, and this it still looks, I don't know, it still looks kind of okay so for this one. But um, some coffees that you will see, these funky anaerobics and whatever, they will, <laughs> the greens look like shit. Yeah, but don't let that influence your, um, your views. Cup, see if it's consistent and see how the flavor is. Huh? And we've seen that uh, it's just like an Ethiopian coffee. Like you, if you look at an Ethiopian coffee or like any kind of, I don't know, uh, very clean, cleanly sort of El Salvador, like the El Salvador will have like one specific variety and the Ethiopia already looks like, okay, it looks kind of weird. It looks like shit, all different kind of sizes and because it's a lot of different varieties that are added and that will what we call heirloom varieties and other stuff. So, um, but if you clean up that Ethiopia, it tastes pretty hollow. It would not taste like uh, like we're used to from Ethiopia. And the same can be said for this one, uh, or at least for now. Like uh, it's been only a few years, so we're, we're also learning, just like you guys. That's it. Uh, sorry, Alec, what was on the table again? Some Colombian fermentations, one Indonesian. Thank you.